in this webinar series with this group of crop growers because we noticed the value of peer learning and how farmers were learning from each other. A key aspect with this group of farmers is that they've all come together for the same reason. They're all interested in the same types of innovations for their cropping practices. In each of these webinars, we cover a lot of practical information. And to help you navigate the content easily, we've created chapters in the description of the video on YouTube. If you're watching this on our website, first, make sure to click on the YouTube logo in the bottom right corner. And then click show more in the description to reveal the chapters. This webinar focused on seeding operations for broad acre cropping and featured two key speakers. Our first farmer was Tom Robinson, who farms near Hoylton in the northern and York region of South Australia. It's approximately 90 kilometres north of Adelaide. His soils are sandy loams and sandy clay loams, with an average rainfall of 450 millimetres. Tom's operation is mostly cropping, but he does run some cattle. In his session, he shared about his mixed enterprise, demonstrating his setup for applying Johnson Sioux based seed coatings, and he also touches on crop nutrition management. I'll probably start off with our summer. First, I've got a few photos here. So we were um, fortunate enough to get uh, some harvest rain, um, which didn't damage any, uh, didn't damage too many crops, which was nice, but allowed us to uh, get a summer cover in. And, uh, and we ended up um, sowing a, a grazing mix there for the cattle and, um, and ended up rotationally grazing this, uh, this mixture about six times over the summer. Um, uh, this was 65 hectares and we had approximately 65 head of cattle, um, stock of cattle on it. Uh, and they spent about three weeks on the summer for on stubbles. So the rest of the time um, they were on this cover crop mix, which was, uh, which was pretty handy. Um, so the other enterprise that came out of that was... <clears throat> Cassie ended up cutting sunflowers and selling them into the local um, florist uh, in Balaclava and also in Clare. So uh, that was uh, spreading the, the spreading the love around the district through uh, through cutting sunflowers and, and selling them um, portable water. So we use um, this is our new portable water setup. <clears throat> so just an eight thousand litre. Roto mold tank on a trailer, and uh, and shifting our cattle every uh, sort of every two to three days uh, as needed, and we're still continuing that through the winter. So this paddock here is now being uh, sown back into a winter winter mix species as well, and the cattle are still there. Well, we're on our um, on our second rotation now of uh, of winter feed. Um, I, I always like moving the fence is uh, is is pretty handy with uh, with grazing, but I really honestly think, you know, the portable water um, does make a massive difference uh, for our operation. Um, remembering that we are 98% grain growers and, and 2% livestock. So <clears throat> um, seeding was pretty stock standard. Um, didn't do much difference. Saw a lot of dust like everybody would have. Um, we run a John Deere single disc seeder, had one for 20 years. Uh, we're on full control traffic. Um, that was just, uh, that was sowing wheat back onto some lentil ground. We did do a bit of tram line renovating this, this summer as well, just fixing up a few control traffic lines. Um... What else have I got here to look at so far? Oh, I should have mentioned this is our... Oh, I'll go get that photo. Um, this is how we're sort of tracking so far, about that 183 mil for the year, but we're about 43 mil down on, uh, on average. Um, so this is our... Um, early, early germinating wheat. We were very lucky to get uh, 20 mil 
there around the middle of May. So this photo was taken on about the 24th, 5th of May. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so we were able to get our majority of our wheat program up and out the ground um, through the middle of May. So wheat back on lentil stubble. Um, I should probably try and show this video if I can. Hopefully there's not much noise. I don't know how this is going to go, guys. Let's do that. This is our um, seed treatment. So uh, uh, we use Johnson Sioux compost uh, in, a, in a seed treater. Uh, basically, that's just a conical uh, cone bottom tank. I might, uh, for those people that have poor internet, I'm very sorry. You can see there we've just got a Honda transfer pump uh, with, uh, with obviously agitation background at the top of the tank. And that's just a cone bottom roto mold tank there. Uh, and then that pump splits two ways. One goes back to the tank, one goes back to the auger. Uh, and we've got an IBC, IBC fill. So in that IBC is, uh, you know, stuff like our worm juice and our milk powder and the myco gold and all that sort of thing. Um, and then the Johnson Sioux compost just gets put in the roto mold um, seed trader and we mix that all up and eventually goes up the auger. Uh, we just cut a hole in the, cut a hole in the auger, hose goes in the top and um, seed is then, treated into the truck. So um, anyone got any questions about that process? It's awfully simple, uh, but seems to work extremely well. So, yeah, no, it's obviously no insecticide, no fungicide on the seed, all, all biologicals on the seed. Yeah, I've got a question for you, Tom. Yeah, mate. How do you go making all of the, like, all your worm juice and all that sort of stuff? What's your timeline? on getting all that stuff ready to put it yep. on your seed. Like, you know, between when you're harvesting, have you got to have your worm juice and everything already cooking then so that you've got it ready for seeding or have you already got it going like, yeah. in the next two months so that it's ready for next year? Yeah, the Johnson Sioux, like we don't, we buy our worm juice. So we buy our worm juice from a reputable worm juice supplier. You don't need much of it. Uh, but the Johnson Sioux is made 12 months out or 14 months out type thing. So the Johnson Sioux we're finding is is around that 14-month process. So that's made, you know, January, February, March, and then that's ready for use for next year. Yeah, oh, just as far as, like, your timeline goes. Yep. Um, that climate over here, when you were putting all that together, is as hot as buggery. Like, Fair enough, you'd be able to keep it cool somehow, but boy, geez, it'd have to, well, it'd burn some water up on my end if I was going to try and start cooking that in January and February. Uh, you mean like the Johnson Sioux or making the seed treatment? Yeah. Well, the, well, the Johnson Sioux, actual part of it is part of your seed treatment though, isn't it? <clears throat> That's right. That's right. So you're, you're saying that the water, the water cost for the Johnson Sioux over the 12-month period to make the Johnson Sioux compost? Oh, I, just, um, I was just trying to work out how you, how you keep it cool enough because on a 48-degree day here where I am in February, yep. I, don't, I don't know whether I'd be able to get it cool enough without it actually cooking every microbe that's actually growing in the Johnson Sioux itself. Yeah, I mean, the Johnson Sioux is a fair size. It, we're using an old, I don't have a photo of my old, John, my new Johnson Sioux, but it's basically a, um, a stock crate, uh, an old ute stock crate that Dad had that's lined. So it's however the bigger a ute tray is by, you know, five feet deep, and it gets watered twice a day. Um, and it just so happens that that Johnson Sioux is on a separate metre up at the shearing shed. Um, and I think it's costing me about 300 bucks a year in water, um, three yep. to 400 bucks a year in water type thing to make that Johnson Sioux. So 
Um, but the microbes would be would be insulated in there. Um, and that's, do you know what? Those microbes have got to be for your conditions. Uh, so if it is 48 right. degrees, well, it's 48 degrees. What's going to live is going to live. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on a Johnson Sioux page on Kind Harvest and there's people in, you know, Europe, stuff like that, making Johnson Sioux all the time in minus conditions and they say the same thing. Well, the microbes live naturally in this condition, in our conditions. They have to live. That's that's the choice they get. If you imagine your Johnson Sioux, and David Johnson talks about this on YouTube videos, your Johnson Sioux is basically just a great big piece of Velcro and all microbes are everywhere. And as the wind passes through in March or April, you'll get a new set of microbes coming through into that Johnson Sioux. You know, one might stick and then grow. So those microbes are actually changing all the time in that Johnson Sioux. Yeah, so when you're saying it's 14 months out to get it ready, yeah. When you so you so you've obviously got two going. Uh yeah, we do. Yeah, we got more than that, but yeah, we've got two going. Yes. Yep. Yeah, because you know, you're using one at seeding right. time, and you've only just started one. Yep, that's right. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh. No and worries. you use use stuff off your own farm too, if you can. Like if you've got some hay bales or some straw. You know, you bow a bit of straw or something like that. Go and grab a bit of native, go and grab a bit of native soil from somewhere if you can as well. Mix a bit of native, only needs to be a shovel full, sprinkled over the top, let it water in. Um, you know, a bit of sheep shit and cow shit and stuff like that. And and um and a bit of straw is fine. In the yep. seating photo there, Tom, have you yep. been out and rolled your paddocks? Or nope. have you been back and slashed them? It just looks like, like, because all the other footage that I've seen of it, your standing stubbles and stuff were reasonably thick. Yep. But that seeding photo you had there, that it looked like the, it had been, you know, either that or it was in a manganese flat where you took the photo. No, but no it's that, just like the stubble that, and stuff. I wasn't sure if you went out and rolled it. No, so that one there or my other wheat one? No, that one there. No, so that's. That there, the that rotation was wheat, wheat, barley, lentils. So there was five the tons, and that's lentil stubble. But as you can see, there's only the minimal residue left of the previous, you know, previous barley stubble there. I, I, yeah. I think we were interested in the other photo, Tom. It looked like you'd rolled the stubble. Yeah, that's the one. That one? Yeah. Yep. yep. So that, that's wheat. This this paddock here is wheat, lentils, wheat. So that there is the wheat stubble from the previous year. Then we've got lentil stubble and then back on wheat stubble, then back on wheat again. Yeah, did, did you yeah. roll that, Tom? Nope. That's how, no. that, how it is. Yeah, uh, that's just, just the way the machine looks when you sold the lentils. Yeah, the, the wheat, the lentils wasn't even rolled. I only ever roll, I've got two paddocks that have got stones and I only ever roll them. I've never rolled anything else. Oh, except a cover crop. I've rolled a cover crop and that was about it. Uh, Tom, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are out spreading your ear with the forecast for Monday and Tuesday. Um, are you doing this or intending to do the same? How much nitrogen do you put out with your um, mixed system there? Um, let me get this photo here up. So that that photo that I just that we were seeing then, Dion, is that photo is the same paddock that one there? Um, so that paddock there, uh, obviously, it's wheat on lentil stubble. Um, my inputs for this year so far on that paddock there is seed and one foliar spray that cost me $21 and there was no nitrogen in that one there. And what's the foliar spray? Uh, the foliar spray was uh, some trace elements and, um, and some biological fertiliser as well, so some BAM. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, this has had no no MAP, no DAP, no urea. Um, so this paddock here is actually a part of Petrolaw's um, nitrogen sampling work. We're tracking nitrogen monthly. So every month he comes out and does a deep end test in the same spot. So, so that paddock there is my heavy, what we're calling a heavy soil. And so you can see here, that was lentils last year, lentils in 20. Uh, where are we looking here? So 20. This was lentils. Previous year it was in wheat. So this was the nitrogen curve per month in the wheat. Then the nitrogen curve in the lentils. We had a lab stuff up in here, unfortunately. Actually, I don't know. I think we run out of funding. Sorry. Funding ran out for two months. But then, so this is this, is this year now. So this, let's follow this red line. So obviously we had a little bit of rain. Um, that harvest rain gave us a kick in January of nitrogen. Um, and then coming back down Feb, March, as we're getting a little bit of tie up. And then April, we got a spike. And then now we're, we're getting a, a nitrogen dip on that wheat in June. Um, and you can see here the light stubble, the light paddock has got lentils in it this year. So we're starting to get a lot of mineralisation. That's from the wheat stubble um, and the lentils starting to nodulate. Um, this new green line that's been added is the cover crop, so where my cattle were. So I said to Pete, I want to know what's going on with where my, where my cover crop is. So you can see here we're down on moisture on the cover crop. Um, and we're also down on nitrogen where that summer cover crop was. Um, if I go back to the raw data now. So you can see here that April 21st, uh, at April 21st, we were down 23 mil where the cover crop was um, and fairly similar there. Uh, and please don't look at those numbers there. They're incorrect. Uh, but you can see there where the where that big, big sub of that big sorghum cover crop was. We're down. Yes, we are down moisture, but we're also down nitrogen. We've got nitrogen tie up as well through that. But if we look back to the heavy soil here, which is the red numbers, 87 kilos in April, 123 kilos in May, back to 63 kilos in June. So, so this is how this is why we're making those nitrogen decisions there, um, Brenton. Um, yep. You know they're not they're not pie in the sky numbers. These are actual actual facts through Petra Law, um, and then to back up our decisions, we're doing SAP testing with Nova Crop Control, and I've got to find the right paddock. That's G four. Um, yeah. paddock here, Denison's, which is the paddock that we're looking at. Um, yeah. How do you go about getting your SAP test sent away, Tom? We, we get them straight to um, DHL Adelaide Airport because we can. Um, but I do believe that there's a courier pickup out of Streaky Bay and Port Kenny as well. So I've been talking to Tommy Dolphin and he wants to do a few. Um, yeah. and I was trying to mark so all my SAP tests and, and same as Terry's is through t- um, Mark Tutman at Productive Ecology in, in WA. He organizes the freight and all that sort of stuff, he organizes everything. We just take the samples, um, drop them to the courier, and um, because we can drop them straight into Adelaide, uh, it only takes us a week to get results back. Um, but for you guys, it might be a week and a half before you get a week and a half to two weeks before you get result, results. Thanks to Tom for some really practical insights about his operational practices. Our next featured speaker was David Foster, who farms near Louth Bay on the Air Peninsula of South Australia. His soils are sandy loams and sandy clay loams, with an average rainfall of 380 millimetres. He runs continuous cropping on his arable country, with livestock limited to the hillier paddocks which are about 25% of the property. David is accompanied by David Davenport, an experienced soil scientist based on the Air Peninsula, and their presentation 
They share about some recent trials involving deep ripping, companion planting, and alternative fertilizers. This is a, a accidental trial from last year. We, um, the company I work for, was setting up a, a, a day, and I thought I'll drag the deep ripper out and sink some beans in deep at about 450 mil as a an, a soil amendment. And uh, and lo and behold, about six, eight weeks later, they, they germinated. They come up from about a, a depth of 450 mil. And uh, that's when I got a bit excited and contacted Dave and, and we started following it through. So we, we, there was a synergy between the wheat and the beans in the soil. Um, you can see on the right there the, the, the individual plants themselves. Um, we, we had a really wet July period last year um, and then a dry spring. So that, that potentially influenced the, uh, the results a bit. But this is what we found. So, Yeah, look, you probably can't see it very well in this photo, but we dug a pit across the bottom of the... Um, uh, demonstration and one of the issues on David's soil is it's quite sodic, it's got very high potassium levels so it's quite dispersive and poorly structured but visually you can see a greater root mass and depth under the beans and rip line and you can see more aggregation in the soil and I did some dispersion tests and there was only half the dispersion on the um, in the soil taken from under the wheat beans compared to just wheat alone. So we, we then took some more measurements, which David did. Yeah, so the, the biomass cuts are significantly higher in the where the bean treatment was and the, look, the average was higher, but we didn't actually flow through to grain yield in the end. Um, because of that dry spring. So it got us excited, but it kind of, kind of let us down at the end. So, um, but there was about 80 units of N applied to the paddock. Um, the, the last application was put through the aeroplane in early August, um, which I think I might try and in the future, or this year, I'm going to delay my second application so that it's going out when soil temperatures are hopefully on the rise again, get um, a higher efficiency. That's one positive that's come out of it for me personally. But uh, we go to the next slide, I guess, Dave. Yeah, so this was the yield data. Yeah, this is the – yeah, here we go. So um, it doesn't – correspond 100% with the, the biomass trip to yield, like I said before, but we're definitely seeing some trends and enough to get us excited to, um, um, yeah. Well, one thing which did show up is that while it was probably later than ideal, um, David did spray out half of the plot in, what, September? Uh, yeah, late August, or it was, yeah. Um, and you can see that where the pots were sprayed um, with the beans, we did get, uh, yeah, half a ton more yield. So we do think it was a water issue. So um, basically, while the highest biomass was the beans and um, wheat, um, we found that, yeah, at the end of the day, the worm pit and the granulox Zed ripped with the highest yielding treatment. Yeah. There's, there's no uh, – the reason I used worm pit is one of, one of our clients had bought a couple of tonne himself, so we, we, he kindly uh, let us um, use a bit for the trial work. So worm hits, I think, this retails about $900 to $1,000 a tonne which is pretty exy. Um, so, and bounce back, which we've used this year, is about $400. What's that going to go on, Dave? 
on the worm hit. Uh, from, yeah. from memory, about 90 kilo. Yeah. Yeah. And what's your normal fertilizer rate down there anyway? Uh, normally about 80 of the uh, granulot Z. Um, yeah. You, so you, your zinc sulfate component of the granulot, um, you're really playing a long game with that because it's going to, a fair percentage of that's going to tie up in the first year of application. And then it'll, it'll roll through over time, and you get that um, that, that kicking, that long term kick through your soil as it mixes through. Yeah, you would have seen this one down uh, for me caught up that day at Louth. Yeah, so for those yeah. who didn't see it, I took some of David's soil and um, look at that chocolate. <laughs> yeah, some of that chocolate and grew some containers and basically what I did was I made up one just using the standard soil um, with some DAT added. Then I made up one <clears throat> with the same amount of DAT, but I grew sweet corn and beans. And then I did one where I used the same amount of DAT, but I also grew some, uh, put some compost through it. But what was interesting is when we opened up the pots, I mean, right from the start, there was a big difference in growth between the, on the left there, the beans with the corn and just the corn on its own. So it shows the role of nitrogen. Is that these pots did not have any additional nitrogen added to them apart from the initial DAP. And very clearly, the corn with the DAP alone was nitrogen deficient, where it wasn't where we grew the beans. What we found is that when we cut open the sweet corn and beans, you, it, the pot stayed together and you had all these fungal associations between the corn and the bean roots. And I think the guys on the day, like Terry and Dave and um, Dion, um, the aha moment. it sort of, it was so visual what was happening just from two bean plants um, that it certainly kept everybody sort of thinking what the heck's going on here. So there you go. That's what we've seen um, with fungal associations, but just more root mass that was holding the soil together so much better. Mm. So this year, yeah. David, David wanted to do some more and we came up with a demonstration. So this is replicated. And these are the treatments. So what we did is we used, when we talk basil, basil is half the standard practice rate of fertiliser. So it's 40, 40 kilo DAP. Yeah, so 40 instead of 80. Yeah. So does that make sense? So what we were trying to do here was cut down the rate of DAP and use manure instead, particularly as manure at the moment is actually cheaper than DAP. D DAP, maybe, maybe fourteen hundred dollars a ton. We got bounced back at four hundred. Uh, landed here. Um, it's a bit of a no-brainer. The other thing we tried to do was so sorry um, was so beans, um, but we had a bit of a stuff up. Um, so has everybody worked out what we're trying to do here? is that what we've done is we've put beans in and we've also cut down the rate of fertiliser by half to see whether the beans would make up the difference. So we spread some uh, lupins, lupins yeah. post-seeding, and then we thought, oh, they're not going to have any soil coverage. So David ran his tractor over them and that completely buggered it. That, that's buggered the structure of the soil on the surface and caused a bit of sealing. And um, you can see a bit of crop loss on the wheat there, um, thinned it out a fraction. So it's recovering, um, and time will tell. We, we may end up with a um, the, the, the good result. Yeah, but the problem we've basically got is, is that, you know, it, it, it really shows you the impact of vehicle traffic, I guess, on this soil type. However, um, so this is the nil. And 
this is where we did use manure and a legume. Um, do you want to explain what we're seeing, David? Well, the, the meal, you, you've got a bit of um, the roots just don't seem to penetrate like we all want them to, to increase that bucket size so that particularly on Air Peninsula and we do run out of moisture and the climate we live in can get a bit of hot in the springtime. So we, we really want to get the roots down deep to make them more resilient. So where the manure and legume has been applied um, we've got double the amount of root mass, or perhaps even a bit more because it's broken off at the bottom there. But you can see on the screen just where my boot is on the right-hand side, there's a bit of a line going through the soil. That's, that's the, um, the equivalent of what we're seeing on the left there. And so the, the synergy between the two has um, grown the bucket down deep, so to speak, for us. And when we when we were sinking the shovel in, um, we found more. There's more earthworms. Yeah. Um, in the in the uh, synergy crop, rather than uh, um, wheat, wheat only. Yeah, that was an interesting observation. I think the root also helps open up the soil profile. But um, you know, if we look, say, for example, on the rip treatment. Um, it's got better root mass, but also better depth. But where you've got the legume roots, which is what we we're talking about, just seem to have got better aggregation, better aggregation, just more root uh, soil around the roots. And we haven't doctored these photos. These were just spades. Nah, these straight out of the paddock, yeah. So it was quite exciting. Um, and we're seeing. Uh, there's pretty consistent results, um, what we're seeing last year and we're seeing again this year. So that's pretty much it. People have questions about that stuff? Yeah, does the Eddie store for uh, lot like smoke? Oh, it looks like chocolate cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you're in the Dion. <laughs> <laughs> I want that soil back that you took home too. <laughs> no, no, don't know anything about it. <laughs> so look, for everybody else who's interested, particularly the got people from the mid-north, David's soil's not hugely dissimilar to yours. It's got those high sodium, high potassium, relatively poor structure. So if we can open it up and get better root symmetry between using a, and I'm not calling it companion cropping, this is more like a starter companion. Yeah, I, I'm calling it synergy cropping. Um, companion, yeah, it's just creating um, more biology in the, in the soil and, um, and they're stealing off each other um, to, for, for mutual benefit, really. Yeah. It's some of the observations I've had this year, like I said, Earlier, um, we, we spread 250 kilo of the bounce back on some paddocks and then just sowed straight into it. it the the earthworm it. activity and this, the, the colour of the soil seems to be changing, like we're getting a bit more carbon in there now. Um, I'm developing a bit of a theory that I think spreading it in front of canola may be the go because just the, the structure of the canola roots, um, they, they, canola is a bit of a, um, it's a soft plant. It's, they say it, I was meant to have a tap root, but it, it easily goes sideways. And I think it's picking up that nutrition a lot quicker. So, and I, I can see what Tom's doing with uh, minimising input. So I, I, have, I admit, I fully admit that I, um, probably more of a high input farmer. You I know, mean, we're targeting six six ton of the hectare wheat crops, and you know, probably up around the three ton for canola. So, but if we can, if we can continue to um, 
and the the fair prices uh, have, will vindicate uh, hopefully what we're trying to do. That, yeah, uh, and and that was the point, I guess, is that the rip treatment here on the left has had double the fertilizer as the rip plus mm. legume. Mm. Oh, don't get me wrong, David. I'm hoping to grow four and five tonne to the hectare, but, you know, I want to spend 100 bucks a hectare to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, we all do. <laughs> mm. Okay. I'm just, I'm just sick of the fertiliser companies fleecing us. Yep, yep. And you, and, and it's, you've got a salt component in that fertiliser. You know, we've got to – and they use an acid in the process to, to make it, so – um it's yeah we're, we're trying to we're trying to grow the soil and if the if the government gets us act together and puts a value on carbon then potentially we're in the box seat so mm -hmm. in the future i'd just like to ask a left field question um could anybody envisage having a seeding unit set up that you would run two separate boxes, two separate pipes, you'll run wheat in one, beans in another, and your depth would be different. Can anybody envisage that going forward? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. That already exists, doesn't it? Yeah, you, you, get a, um, you can get a dual boot that puts fertiliser below the seed now. You don't even have to put the beans in the fertiliser tank and not put the fertiliser out and you'd be in doing the same thing. Why do you want the two different depths? Oh, I just thought that the, the beans, it just it fascinated me that the beans are coming up from so deep. And I just thought if you could get your beans down, you know, in, into row, every second row, you've got beans that say, you know, six inches and in your wheat's at an inch and a half. I don't know. I'm just chucking ideas around. Like I said, I'm not a farmer. I just keep throwing questions out there. That's all. Uh, oh, Steve, I, I, I totally agree with um, your thought process there. I don't. I wouldn't stop there. Even I'd, I'd be aiming for a, a triple box um, and getting you know, more down there. Like, you know, why can't we use vetch at twenty kilo? Um, be beans are good because um, they got a lot of energy. They're, they're a big seed, and um, to get them up and going, and they've got a fantastic root architecture. But vetch is pretty good too, and. Um, it makes for a good sheep feed. Um, sheep won't graze beans. Um, they, it's one of the last things they'll actually eat. Um, I've got a couple of clients that are doing beans with uh, forage radish, and that's, an, that's another fantastic synergy crop um, for livestock. Um, but yeah, if you can, more the better. I, I, it's, a bit longer season. The thing about the beans, the actual uh, the, their characteristics, they are a bit of a longer season uh, plant. And I think if you're going to do vetch with it, you probably want to aim more for a, a Marava variety. Um, Rosina and Timok and so forth are, are quite an early uh, early variety. So you that will restrict your um, length of season. So. Nah, I'm all for it. I, I, I wish my bank balance is a bit bigger. I'll be doing it right now. <laughs> Thanks very much to all of our speakers and webinar participants. So much learning comes from the group interaction with questions and answers. Thanks also to the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund for supporting this webinar series. You can find more resources about this and other webinars in the description of this video below. We would love to run more of these events, and if you would like to become part of our growing farmer community, join our social media pages and subscribe to our newsletter to hear about the next opportunity.